In July 1998, the anime Serial Experiments Lane first aired on television, and it immediately left an entire generation of anime fans wondering, what in the hell did I just watch? But over the years, the anime has really struck a chord with many people. Through its presentation, its atmosphere, its ideas, and the character of Lane herself, it's become a show that means a lot to many people all around the world. However, at the same time, a game was released for the PlayStation 1, called PSX Lane. And while the anime has held on to a really dedicated cult following, the game has been mostly relegated to a footnote. For most fans of the show, the game is just a curiosity, a little oddity. I did too, for a long time. But having played it, I now think that's entirely unfair. In my opinion, PSX Lane not only deserves to be considered alongside the anime, it deserves to be seen as its own standalone piece of art. Even though they share the same protagonist, the Lane game tells a story that is all its own, and that story is one of the most heart-wrenching, fascinating things I've ever experienced. So I want to talk about PSX Lane, about its story, and about how it tells that story, about the themes it tackles, and about what the game means to me. To call Lane a game is only somewhat accurate. It's more of a visual novel in which you experience the story through reading through the diary entries of the main character, as well as the transcripts of the counseling sessions that Lane goes through throughout the game. It's through this, as well as through a number of cutscenes, that the story of PSX Lane is told to you. That story focuses on two characters. Yonera Toko, a 27-year-old university graduate who's just starting up her job as a counselor, and Iwakura Lane, a 12-year-old girl suffering from hallucination. And for most of the game, Toko serves as Lane's counselor, trying to help her to overcome her hallucination. We're first introduced to Toko at the beginning of the game, and we read about her preparations to start her new job. While reading through Toko's diary entry, we find out that she's been struggling with a lot of isolation. She went to university in America, and so upon returning to Japan, she has very few actual contacts around her. The few friends she's been able to hold on to have grown apart from her over the years, and her boyfriend, Takashi, seems extremely dis- He appears to be uninterested in Toko, and barely bothers stringing her along in their relationship. As well as this, she's grown used to the culture of America, and as such, she finds reintegrating into Japanese society to be difficult, and quite unpleasant. These diary entries detail the frustrations that she goes through in a mostly light-hearted manner, as Toko tries to make the best of her situation, but it does show that there is a tension that will only increase from this point on. Lane, on the other hand, appears to be a mostly normal 12-year-old girl. In early conversations with her childhood friend Kyoko, Lane appears as shy and socially awkward, often nervously going along with what Kyoko is saying and doing. Lane, like Toko, is quite isolated from the world, having only Kyoko and her parents for company. It's in this early game that we see the really unique way in which PSX Lane tells its story, and that's through the use of diary entries. Because reading Toko's early entry is actually fun. She comes across as a bubbly and nice person who begins by being excited for her new job, and who tries to keep a brave face despite her situation. And reading Lane's entries is the same. We get a real sense of her insecurities, how she wants to be close to people, but is too shy and nervous to express herself, and how she's ended up emotionally reliant on Kyoko as her only friend. All of this makes the characters feel human and fully fleshed out. We are constantly presented with the honest emotions of the characters, and this helps us to feel like we understand them on a level that not many other stories achieve. Even though a lot of media allows us access to the thoughts of the main characters, PSX Lane is exceptionally dense in the sheer amount of storytelling that it does through its characters' thoughts. It places you squarely in their perspective, and lets you see the world how they do. All of this is strengthened by the fact that the characters use voice actors to read out their lines. Again, it humanizes. They're not just sprites and text, they have actual human voices. And hearing real people speaking these lines help us to empathize even more with the people who are talking. The early parts hardly feel like a game at all. It feels a lot more like you're just seeing the thoughts of two totally normal people. Lane's first diary entry is literally just her wondering what she should even write in her diary, which is like exactly what someone would write for their first entry, isn't it? The realistic way in which the characters are presented helps you to view them as actual people, and it's especially interesting when compared to the show, where most of the time you just had no clue what was going on through the heads of any of the characters. The show felt like it went for a very mysterious, the world feels alien and unwelcoming, and the characters are almost like robots, indifferently carrying out the protocol. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that the dreamlike atmosphere of the show is really cool, but at the same time, the game helps us to become a lot more emotionally attached to the characters and this makes for a much more poignant experience. I felt invested in this version of Lane and Toko in a way that I just didn't for anime Lane. 
Getting back to the plot, Toko and Lane's lives first become intertwined after Lane experiences hallucination. She starts hearing voices coming from the power lines around the city. She has vivid nightmares, and she hallucinates other kids in an empty playground. And it's because of that that she is sent to a counselor, and that Toko receives her first patient. The early counseling sessions are honestly really sweet. Toko acts very gentle and nurturing towards Lane, while trying to coax her into talking about her issues. Lane is uncomfortable at first, but eventually opens up and becomes incredibly curious about Toko's line of work. Again, watching the two talk is a lot of fun, and you can see their relationship growing naturally. At the same time, they discuss many different aspects of psychology, from neurosis to sleep paralysis to schizophrenia. And in particular, they talk about the developing identities of adolescents. It's genuinely fascinating to read, and Toko explains all of this just like how a psychiatrist would. I'm not an expert on psychology, but from what I can tell, they give really accurate explanations on how these conditions work. Like at one point, Toko is writing to her superiors, and she accurately labels a number of symptoms for schizophrenia, while explaining why she doesn't believe that Lane is suffering from the disorder. I don't know if any of this seems very impressive, but it helps so much in establishing the sense of realism in the early game. And for a game made in the late 90s to go this much in depth in developing a world and to have such a strong understanding of mental illness, that's really fantastic. But as things continue, Lane begins to attract the attention of a boy named Tomo. And just before he transfers to another school, Tomo sends a letter specially to Lane, just to tell her how he's doing. However, when Kyoko finds out about this, She's enraged that Lane would garner the attention of Tomo, and as a result, Kyoko starts to ignore Lane over that shared crush of a boy who's not even in the school anymore. It's a horribly petty and cruel thing to do, especially because the two have been friends since childhood, and what Kyoko effectively does is that she entirely isolates Lane from her classmates, because Kyoko was the only connection that she had. And over time, Kyoko's ignoring turns into bullying, and Lane begins to skip classes just to get away from it. Lane's entries become increasingly riddled with insecurities, when her teacher tells her that he understands that she's not feeling okay, and that she can graduate through online classes if she likes. Lane takes that as him not wanting her to return to the school, and fears that he hates her. Her anxiety causes her to arrive at the worst case scenarios, and watching the adults around her try to help only causes her to feel useless. Her parents themselves begin to get into arguments about what they should do, even as they hide this conflict from her, she hears it, and she blames herself. She feels like a burden to her parents, like an inconvenience to her teacher, and she can't bring herself to say any of this to Toko. Even as her diary bleeds with worries, she can't express any of that to her counselor. And it's not ever really explained why she can't explain this to Toko, so I can only assume that it's out of nervousness. And I mean, if you've ever been to a therapist, especially as a child, it can be incredibly daunting to be facing an authoritative adult and to tell them about all your deepest fears. Like, what if they judge you? What if they tell on you and make your parents even more worried about you than they already are? It's really interesting to watch Toko talk about how Laim seems fine in her reports to her bosses, and then immediately afterwards to read about how terrible Lane is feeling. It's a really genuine showing of how anxiety can erupt during adolescence, as you're torn from the comfortable world of childhood fun into this new world where everything is changing so fast and you feel lost and alone, and it makes Lane into even more of a relatable character. In her notes, Lane often begins to wonder about much more existential questions as she tries to understand the world. She starts to ask things like, Is there a meaning to why I'm here? Or, What does everybody think of me? Does anybody think anything of me? She's around that age where kids start developing more of a sense of who they are, and this is evident in all the worries that Lane is having about herself. In order to keep up with her classes, Lane and her dad set up a computer in her room, and this is when Lane first comes across the internet. Here, she feels so much more comfortable. Everybody is kind and welcoming, and she can connect with people in a way that she never could before. The internet starts as a reprieve from her loneliness. She rapidly learns how to program, and she's exceptionally good at it. At the same time, her dad leaves home on a business trip, which further strips Lane of any reason to interact with the outside world. For a brief moment, she immerses herself completely in the online world, and almost abandons the heartless real world. But as anyone who's ever been online for any amount of time will know, it's hardly all sunshine and rainbows on here. And as she peers into the darker side of the web, she starts finding out how horrifying it can actually be. First by stumbling across shock and gore sites, then by being sent gore pictures by strangers on the internet, and then finally by having her diary hacked and leaked online. On top of that, she's spooked when she stumbles upon an entity who appears like another version of her lurking on the web. 
This other version of her doesn't do anything, but it's understandably extremely unsettling for her, and it's far from the last time that we'll meet this entity. All of the deeply unsettling things that Lane has found online snaps her interest away from the internet, and by this point she's transferring into a junior high school. It's a new start, an opportunity to leave Kyoko and her bullying in the past. Lane vows that this time she will make friends at school, this time she will be more social, and that this time things will be different. On her first day, Lane meets and befriends a girl named Masato. From there, the two become extremely close, with Lane talking at length in both her diaries and Totoko about how fantastic Masato is, how talented and nice she is, and how much she likes Masato. When the world seemed to be falling away, she found Misato to cling to and to bring her back from the edge. And yet, through this happiness, it becomes clear that Lane has formed the same reliance on Masato that she did with Kyoko, and that she's become almost obsessed with Masato. Most of her diary entries at this point are single-mindedly interested in Masato, about how great Masato is, or about what she and Masato did. And when Masato temporarily leaves school due to an illness, Lane's fears come right back. She feels like a coward for being scared to contact Masato, as though she really hasn't changed at all, and she's still the timid person who she always was. She openly wonders, wouldn't it be better if a cowardly person like me dies? Even when Lane is with Masato, it's hinted that the happiness she feels may be only her tricking herself. One of her entries reads, I'm not forcing myself to laugh, this is me, as though she's molding herself to fit in with what she thinks will impress Masato but sometimes her true feelings seep through the mask and onto the page. And as their friendship continues, Lane starts to realize that she might be faking her feelings, that she may not really be enjoying herself around Masato, and that she might just be pretending to be someone who she's not. And it scares her, because if she's putting on a personality, then the person that Masato likes isn't her. It's someone else, a stranger who Lane has just been pretending to be. In fact, what if Masato learned about the fact Lane is in therapy? Would she start to look down on Lane? After all, Kyoko abandoned her for just as stupid a reason, so maybe Masato will do the same? On top of that, Toko grows increasingly annoyed at Lane's constant questioning. This is mostly due to difficulties in Toko's own life, but Lane perceives it as because she's normal now. She worries that she's wasting Toko's time, and at the same time, her parents are, too, becoming less loving. Again, Lane wonders if it's because she's no longer sick. My family used to encircle me. It seems to be coming apart since I haven't had any problems recently. Lane's identity is splitting in two, and she no longer knows who she even is. Again, this is a really poignant take on identity in adolescence. Around 12 or 13, you change so much that you become a stranger to the carefree kid you once were. You struggle to figure out what defines you, and Lane seems to define herself exclusively by her connections to others, rather than by her own merit and this is causing her to lack a strong identity of her own. Misato is someone who she feels that she can rely on, and her relationship to Misato becomes Lane's identity. But Misato is a whole different person, and there are so many thoughts and actions that make up a single person, that nobody else can truly ever understand or completely know that person. Lane can't ever understand all of Misato, and Misato can't ever understand all of her. But that just begs the question, if the two don't really know each other, at least not as well as they think they do, then is the friendship they have truly real? And if their friendship isn't real, then who is Lane? She's defined herself by her connection to Masato, after all. So if that connection is cut, then what does Lane have left to define herself by? These are some of the questions that start to buzz around Lane's head. It's at this point that Lane's idea of Masato starts to come apart. Up till now, Masato has been supremely talented, kind, and cool. However, it emerges that she has been entering possibly plagiarized artworks into a competition, and all of a sudden, Misato crumbles under the weight of these accusations, no longer the person she once was, and it shakes Lane's perception of her to the core. Because Misato would never do something like that, would she? But everyone's saying she did, so who should she believe? Eventually, the scrutiny she's under becomes just too much, and Misato moves away. She leaves without saying a word to Lane. No goodbye, no nothing. Lane's idea of Masato has been shattered, and even those fragments of the person she knew have been stolen from her, leaving Lane to wonder who Masato even was in the first place. She doesn't want to see Toko anymore. She doesn't want to go to school. She doesn't even understand why she's here at all. And it's with that realization that we enter Site B.
Throughout Side A, Lane struggles mainly with identity and loneliness. Ordinarily at this point in a child's life, they're trying to find themselves and to understand the new person who they're growing into, but Lane faces a great deal of difficulty in that. She doesn't really have that many things going on, other than the few connections with others that she's made, and so when those connections are stripped away from her, she feels lonely and loses her sense of identity, loses all that defines her, and Site B tells the story of her further descent into disconnection until she can see only one solution left. There are no diary entries from Toko in between the middle of Site A and the beginning of Site B, and as a result, I haven't been talking that much about how she's been doing. However, her personal struggle once again becomes extremely important to the plot in Site B. We find out that over the course of Site A, Toko and Takashi's relationship has become more and more distant. They barely even talk anymore. Toko's work has become less and less fulfilling. She doesn't like counseling Lane, and her boss, Professor Takashima, sends her to do all the worst, most asinine work. On top of that, Toko notices that he's been looking at her inappropriately. Her co-workers are no better, regularly gossiping about her and bullying her. So when Toko meets another colleague named Yoshida, she's elated to find another person who seems genuinely interested in her. Yoshida offers her a prototype of a machine he's been developing, called RML. The machine is meant to soothe stress, and Toko quickly becomes romantically attracted to Yoshida, but yet, she still feels like she has to stay with Takashi, even though she doesn't really love him anymore, and he clearly doesn't love her, she feels like she has to. But as time passes, it becomes increasingly unclear as to whether she and Takashi are even formally in a relationship, until finally, Toko hears the news that Takashi is getting married to another woman, and that the relationship she thought she had was an illusion, so she's devastated when this illusion falls apart. She can barely push herself to go to work for another day, she hates her job, she hates her life, she feels tired and angry, and her understanding of herself diminishes with each day. She starts to think about how she didn't used to be like this. She used to be happy, didn't she? And who is she now? She's not even sure anymore, but at the very least, she has Yoshida. He's the only person who's nice to her. He's all she really has left. Yoshida quickly becomes Toko's version of Misato. Toko projects her hopes onto Yoshida. She's alone and unsure of who she's become, She's having an identity crisis that mirrors what Lane is going through, and she sees Yoshida as the person who can steady her. But she barely knows Yoshida, she's just built up an idea of him out of what she needs him to be, and just like Masato, their friendship was never real, because Togo catches Yoshida laughing at her like the rest of her co-workers. He was never the man who she hoped he would be. It's even implied that RML has been affecting Togo's thought processes and aggravating her mental decline, painting him to be an outright malicious figure who was only manipulating Toko for an unknown purpose. Toko and Lane are now as isolated as each other, and their perceptions of realities are quickly coming undone. These dire entries are spread across Site B and are presented to us slowly, which only draws out how painful it is to watch Toko's slow decline into mental illness. Toko is a really likable character throughout Site A, and because of that, we can empathize a lot with her plight in Site B, but on top of that, Toko was a stable presence in the story up till now. The counseling sessions between her and Lane were almost comforting. Reading about what Lane was going through gets very emotionally exhausting after a while, and the counseling records are something to look forward to. We see the world through Lane's eyes, and so hearing her talking to Toko about all sorts of interesting things is kind of a break from all that. What Toko says doesn't even comfort Lane that much, so it feels a lot like the counseling is helping us to cope with our journey through Lane's psyche. And the first thing that Site B does is it takes that stable presence, and it mentally corrodes her into dust. It immediately shows us that it will be pulling no punches. Lane's life further crumbles around her. She stops going to school, and her parents start getting into more and more fights. Her mom becomes more distant, and her dad is left as the only comfort she has. But the fights continue. Lane can hear them more and more often, and she blames everything on herself. She knows now that her return to normality was nothing but an illusion, that fundamentally, nothing has changed. Her dad starts acting more and more violently towards her mum, and eventually ends up abandoning the house altogether. Lane's mum begins to throw things at her daughter, and locks Lane in the house during most of the day. Lane realises that she's completely isolated. She has nobody. Her dad was the only constant in her life. He was almost always there to provide Lane with compassion. When Kyoko betrayed her, at least she had a family to come home to. When Masato disappeared, at least her dad was there for her and now he's gone. He's left his own daughter to deteriorate mentally. Lane starts increasingly having intrusive thoughts. She questions her identity, 
wondering if she's even her mum's biological daughter. Her mind starts to fall into uncertainty. Will everyone I love become unhappy? Will they become unhappy because I feel love for them? Am I the one at fault? What about me is wrong? Is my own physical appearance an illusion or an ordinary phenomenon? In the face of all of this, she returns to using the internet excessively for comfort. When it's happened before, she had her dad and she had Masato to pull her away from this obsession, and now she has no one. And once again, she starts to see herself on the net. It starts to feel like the other version of herself is taunting the real her. The doppelganger seems so much happier than she is, even though she isn't real. It scares and angers Lane, and she decides that she needs to find a way to be happy, so she turns to the only option she can think of. Lane wants her father back. By this point, he's the only person who really matters to her, but there's nothing she can do to get him back. He's gone. Lane, however, doesn't want to accept this. She can't accept it. And so, she purchases an AI program and sets it up to start saying basic phrases in a copy of her dad's voice. These start with things like, Hi Lane, how are you? It makes her happy. It's a comfort to her. She has a friend again who can reassure her that she matters, but this brief happiness will be snatched away by Toko, of all people. One day during counseling, Toko tells Lane that she thinks that she's making Misato up. Toko reveals that she's been talking to Kyoko and some of Lane's other classmates, and that they don't appear to remember Misato. In fact, she can't seem to find any evidence of Misato's existence at all. Lane tries to protest. Misato is real. She knows it. She can remember Misato. But all the evidence is pointing against it. Nobody else remembers Misato. Lane goes to Misato's old house, and it seems like it hasn't been inhabited in years. Does that mean that there's something wrong with Lane's memories? And if that's the case, if Misato is just a fragment of Lane's memory, then how can we trust what Lane is writing? We are seeing things through Lane's perspective after all, and she could very well have been a more unreliable narrator than we'd realize. How can she trust her memories if Masato was fake? If such a large part of her life was a fabrication, could her dad have been fake? Was Kyoko fake? All she has is memories of them, so who even knows? I genuinely love how this moment is revealed. We've been seeing this through Lane's perspective for the entire game, and the reveal that Masato's existence was probably false is as jarring for you as it is for her. The reality we see is filtered through the minds of Toko and Lane, and as they get less sure of their realities, you feel it. You are in their shoes, and you go through all the confusion they go through. Just like how the early game felt realistic, the last third of the game rips apart that realism as things get more and more bizarre. As reality and illusion meld together into a horrifying uncertainty, we are dragged along with the characters. The latter parts of the game are very confusing, and often quite hard to understand, but I feel like it works. When the show acts all obtuse with what it's trying to say, it feels kind of annoying to be honest, like it's trying to be cryptic for the sake of seeming smart. That's not to say there isn't a purpose, but the show goes way too far. However, when the game does it, there is a clear purpose, to make the experience all the more personal, to make us understand how the characters are feeling. They're frightened and uncertain of what is happening to them, and because of that, you are also confused. It makes you feel how they do. When I was playing first, I wasn't 100% sure what was going on, but I understood the emotions, I was right there with the characters, and I felt a second-hand version of what they felt. You are just as bewildered and uncertain as the characters, and that puts you directly in their perspectives, to tell the story in a really personal way. Immediately after this, we come to an integral part of the game, a part called The Nightmare of Fabrication. This is a short comic written by the series' art director, Yoshitoshi Abe, and it depicts Lane's struggles with her own memory. Late one night, Lane is thinking about what Toko has said to her, and it makes her feel disconnected from everyone. Not only does she have no one she feels comfortable enough to talk to, but her mental illness makes her feel cut off from all those around her, so she creates a plan to reconnect herself into the world. She takes her cherished stuffed dog, Biki, a symbol of her childhood innocence, and she begins to cut him open. She inserts mechanical parts into him, which allow him to move all on his own. Lane assures him that once she finishes his design, She'll create new versions of everyone she ever cared for. A new dad, a new mum, a new Misato, and a new Kyoko. And these ones will never be able to hurt her again. She'll make sure of it. And she'll make sure that she's never going to be alone again. But there's a fault in her design, causing the machine to overheat and explode. Her beloved Bike lies in tattered, smoldering pieces all over her floor. And just as Lane begins to weep, she hears a voice. It promises her that it can bring back her toy for her. She agrees, and the voice materializes into a man named Masami Eri. He pulls a new Bike from out of the void, and hands it to Lane. But that's not right. This isn't Bike. It's just a replica of him. Eri replies that 
If no one can remember that the old BK is dead, then it's as if it never happened. Lane retorts that she will remember, she will know it's fake. But of course, Eri says, it's not like her memory can't be rewritten. And really, this isn't the first time she's rewritten her own memory. She's done this before. This isn't even the first time she's destroyed BK. Lane begs the man to stop. She knows who she is, doesn't she? But Eri insists, where your thoughts end and reality begins is a very thin line. Everyone can overcome that barrier. Reality is only formed by your perception of it. You think you can look at things objectively? Your emotions cloud your memories, and those memories go more and more distant. They distort more and more, like a corrupted record. Who's to say what you remember is real? Is there proof of it? Or is there just a faint bit of knowledge you have in that flawed, fallible brain of yours? How do you know any of that is true? How do you know- Lane wakes up in her bed. It was all just a dream. Just a scary dream. And BK is right there with her. He was never destroyed. Never. I remembered a terrifying dream, but none of the details. I didn't want to think about it, so I buried it under the swing, in the back garden. If nobody knows, it can be the same as if it never happened at all, so I'm secretly rewriting my memories. I've buried that scary dream, because it never happened. The more I think about it, the more frightening and fascinating the nightmare fabrication becomes. Like, we all know that our memories are imperfect. We can't remember details, so we fill them in with incorrect information. We blur different events together, and we outright forget a lot of things that have happened. But this short presents us with the idea that our memories are entirely unreliable. The reality in our memories isn't real, we can acknowledge that. But do we know how fake it really is? What if much more of our memories are fabricated than we think? I mean, we never know. It's the idea of waking up one day to find that the things we knew were never true in the first place. The life we thought we had was just a fabrication. That idea is horrifying because of how helpless it makes us feel, and how uncertain of everything it makes us feel. And it's even more scary because Lane understands on a level that she's doing it. She's overwriting these memories because reality has just become too painful for her to bear. At the same time, I think it also serves as a metaphor for Lane repressing her memories. She pushes down these uncomfortable truths away from her conscious mind, and in doing that, Lane thinks that she'll be able to escape from them forever, that they won't exist anymore. But that's not true. In pushing them away, these memories have poured into her subconscious. They're still there, bubbling under the surface, festering in Lane's unconscious mind, waiting to flood back and overwhelm her in the most harmful way possible. Lane knows that she can't build back her loved ones with machines, it didn't work when she tried it with BK, and the replacement BK was just not the same as the original. But that memory is gone now. It's buried. It's forgotten. She's repressed it. So she doesn't have to pay attention to it anymore. And with that memory gone, she can continue on her new project, to truly create a new father. Lane has always been very skilled at programming and mechanics, but this point in the story is where her abilities increase to an almost supernatural level. Her programs become more advanced, her AI more intricate so that it can come as close to acting like a real person as possible. She takes that rudimentary program that she used as a replacement for her dad, and she improves it, so that it acts like her dad did, or at least acts like the version of him that she wants to remember. But having a voice coming from a computer screen isn't enough, and so she starts to build her father a body. Yet she can't recreate that human form, and so the body ends up as a horrific, headless abomination of wires and false flesh. But Lane doesn't care. As long as she can hug her dad again, that's all that matters. But no, this isn't her dad. This thing can't think of its own. It can't talk on its own. Its emotions are phony. It says such kind things, but not of its own will. It doesn't have a will. Lane knows that this thing will never be her dad. She's failed, but what can she do? There's only one option. This memory, this knowledge that her dad is fake, is the only thing keeping her from being happy with her dad. And as such, she has to rewrite it. She has to repress it. That memory never existed. Father is fully sentient, and Lane loves him. There was never any other reality. I'll always keep my eye on you, Dad. I'm connected to you. It's around this time that Lane starts seeing that online version of herself, but this time, it's a little different. I had that hallucination of me for the first time in a long while. The me in the hallucination had grown. She had conviction in her eyes. Lane doesn't know what to think of her doppelganger, while the real Lane has only been growing weaker and weaker. This version of her in the online world has been growing stronger and stronger. It almost makes Lane want to join her, and the thought of maybe joining that doppelganger slowly becomes more and more appealing throughout the story. Coming back to Toko, she starts growing more and more unhinged. She wonders out loud if the girl opposite her is really even Lane. She grows angry at Lane's constant questioning and lashes out at her. 
she starts to realize that her own perception of Lane might not be who Lane really is. She tries to list Lane's personality traits, but Lane refutes all of these. She tells Toko that she isn't all the person that Toko thinks she is. That makes Toko wonder, does she really know Lane at all? Toko finds out that Lane has been hacking into her diary and reading what she's been saying in her private report. She grows to fear that Lane is controlling her. She seems to split between despair and denial as her mental health spirals. She begins to despise Lane, to think that Lane is the cause of the misery in her life. She begins to project her problems onto Lane, just like how she projected her hopes onto Yoshida. Toko grows to hate Lane, but she's also connected to Lane. Lane is all that she has left. She's the only person that Toko knows. And because of this, because of the need to give meaning to her life, Toko collapses into her persona as a counselor. It becomes what she uses to define herself, but Lane seems to take even that from her. During their sessions, the traumatized Toko begins to fill the position as a patient, and Lane becomes like the counselor. And if Toko has no identity outside of that role, then who is she once that role is supplanted by her own patient? And in fact, is this the same Toko that we met at the start of the game? Sure, she has the same voice, same face, and she's technically the same person. But she's a stranger to the bubbly person that she was at the start of the game. Toko struggles with this. She cries out, Who is another me? There's only one of me! The only place I exist is here. No matter where I go, I'm me. Toko starts to slip into psychosis. She can no longer differentiate between what's real and what's not. Everything is just so lonely, so uncertain. Like Lane, Toko has lost all that defined her. She's going through a terrifying identity crisis. Toko's identity boils down to understanding her patient. And in a final attempt to do that, Toko tries to access Lane's personal information. She finds that there are no records of Lane before three years ago. There's nothing here to suggest that Lane existed at all before three years ago. Sure, Lane had memories of life before that, but we've already discussed how fragile memory is. How can we say that Lane can't just rewrite her own memory to trick herself into thinking that she's a real child? And that begs the question, who even is Lane? What's wrong with me? I'm not like the one I used to be. Who am I? Lane doesn't even know that herself. She was just as unaware that most of her life may have been fabricated as we were. Lane's concept of who she is has degraded completely. She needs someone to reassure her that she's real. She needs someone to help her to understand herself. But she has no one. Her mom is gone. Toko is in no position to help. And even strangers on the street act like she isn't there. Is she even there? She doesn't know anymore. She just feels so disconnected. Like she's not even human anymore. Sometimes she becomes entirely unfeeling towards everybody else. And imagine for a second if you were in her position. You've lost everything. Through little fault of your own, you've been abandoned by everyone. You don't know who you are, you don't even know if you're real. And at the same time, the hallucinations are still there. You're practically trapped in that psychosis, where you don't know what's real and what's fabrication. Imagine how terrifying that would be. Think of what you would do to escape from that limbo. I think a lot of people would do almost anything for the chance to get away from that. Lane is so desperate by now that she's willing to sacrifice anything for a bit of relief. And she starts to think, where could I go so that I could be connected to everyone? The real world is so lonely and confusing. Where can I go to just make everything clear? And a part of her whispers back that she could become connected through the internet. The web has always been there for her when she needed it, and everyone is connected through the web. She remembers the other version of herself on the internet, how confident and content she was. Lane thinks that she could be like that. Lane has been discovering her supernatural abilities for a while now. But it's only now that she figures out that she has the ability to create a copy of her consciousness and upload it to the web, where a version of her can live forever and know everything. Who cares for humanity? Humanity has abandoned her. All that matters is being connected. And through that, she hopes that she can finally be happy. But then again, this version of her isn't really her. It's only a copy of her, one that will mirror her feelings, but won't be the same person. Won't even be a real person in the first place. It's not clearly stated, but I believe at this point Lane has mentally split in two. There's the conscious mind, who really is just a traumatized and lonely child. And then the unconscious mind, the one who whispers to Lane that there's another way. It is the part of her that she tried to bury. Lane expelled so many memories from her conscious mind, but those memories weren't forgotten. Her unconscious remembered, and all of that repression only strengthened it. And now it seems like it has begun to take control of Lane's body so that it can achieve her goal of connecting to the internet. Lane alternates between being controlled by her conscious and her unconscious, but this unconscious version of her surfaces and begins acting in violent ways. She has none of the moral inhibitions that conscious Lane does. All she wants to do is fulfill her goal 
and she will do anything to achieve that. She uses supernatural abilities to manipulate a girl into shooting another person just so that she can gain access to a gun. And when Conscious Lane finds that gun, she doesn't even know how it got there. She's already repressed that memory, and as far as she's concerned, it never existed. It's not made very clear, but I believe that the unconscious Lane starts to take advantage of Toko's illness, and begins to convince her that the only way out of this misery is through connecting herself on the internet, telling her that it would be best if she allowed herself to be absorbed into the net, and to abandon her mind, to leave everything behind. And I believe that the unconscious Lane was doing this as a test, to see if connecting your consciousness to the internet is truly possible. Toko resists at first. She wants to remain herself. She wants to remain human. But she's exhausted and the promise of freedom from all of the stress and uncertainty. It's intoxicating, and Toko eventually gives in. There's a sudden shift in her diaries, from loathing Lane to almost worshipping Lane, and seeing Lane as the only solution to her problems. Unconscious Lane has manipulated and brainwashed Toko into being her guinea pig and becoming emotionally reliant on her. Yonera Toko uploads a copy of her consciousness to the net and dies by suicide. Shortly afterwards, her last words are these. The me that has a body will disappear, won't it? My hands, my face, my hair. It'll be sad at first, so stay by my side. We'll eliminate all trivial thoughts. Let's eliminate everything trivial in this world. The only people that exist are me and Lane. It's deeply upsetting to watch Toko go down this path. At every turn, you hope that there will be something that can pull her out of this depression. But no, there's nothing. Nobody at any point tried to save Toko. She was, in bluntest terms, a pawn for others. First Takashi, who strung her along, then her boss, Takashima, who used her essentially as a secretary and never allowed her to do any of her own research, then Yoshida, who manipulated her for his own enjoyment. It's even hinted that her own company has been degrading her mental health for the sake of their experiments. And finally, even Lane turned against her. It was Lane's unconscious, sure, but it was still Lane who betrayed her. And it's so sad to watch these things happen to her, because she's a genuinely kind person. We've known that from the beginning. Nobody ever seemed to see that in her though. She never had any other option than to be a puppet in the stories of those around her. Immediately afterwards, we see the conscious Lane in a cutscene, lying peacefully while Robo Dad hugs her, just like how her real dad used to. Lane looks so peaceful, so calm. It's like the last vestiges of her humanity are clinging to her father for comfort like she's trying one last time to find some kind of love for this world, but she knows, deep down, that it's fake. Her father isn't hugging her. A robot who she calls father is hugging her. At this moment though, she's so happy that she doesn't care. But in time, her unconscious emerges, and this Lane knows that she can never truly talk to her father again. The unconscious wants to destroy the physical form of her father, so she takes a metal bat and begins to repeatedly smash his body until it collapses onto the floor. And there he lies, his wires seeping coolant like blood from his arteries. He raises a hand up to the person who he's been programmed to love and to care for, but she doesn't even look at him. Lane has finally severed all connections to the real world. And now, we enter the final layer of the game, level 13. In the first entry, Lane tells us that a year has passed since she last wrote in her diary and that today begins her countdown. It appears that the subconscious mind has either taken over or has joined with Lane's conscious mind, as she seems to have come to terms with what she is about to do. She intends on giving up her consciousness and creating a new self to enter into the net. The suicide of Toko was upsetting and shocking to an extent, but we now know exactly what Lane is planning on doing. And the way that the game describes these last few entries is really interesting. Lane tells us that she's going on her last walk, and I mean, think about that. She acknowledges that this is her last walk, the last time she'll ever go outside. She knows that she will never again see the flowers or the trees, that she'll never again look up to the sky and feel the breeze brushing against her face, that in a few hours, everything will be over. In my experience, as someone who has at one point in his life thought that he was going on his own last walk, it feels empty, hollow, like your emotions have shut down and you've drifted into feeling like nothing. That's just my own subjective experience of it, but I think Lane feels the same. She speaks about it in a neutral tone, as though she's already given up. This game is fantastic in portraying emotions, as we've already talked about, but this scene just really hit me. I know it might seem small, but I appreciate how it was portrayed. Lane meets her mum on the walk, who acts as though she's a stranger. Is this a hallucination, or has something happened to her mum? 
Either way, it drives home the feeling of emptiness in the air. Lane wonders about her existence, asking, Do I have a sad existence? I guess people think so. I don't mind that much. Her mind is calm, but her body starts to feel fear as her last moments draw near. Even when I'm not dying, my body feels fear. Mysterious. Is the reason I have the potential to feel fear no matter what I do because of what's recorded in my genes? I don't need those kinds of genes. This is a small world that seems large only to parasites. She stands on the bridge and feels the rain on her face one last time. Before her stands another version of herself, the one who will soon enter into the web to live forever. They have a brief discussion on what it means to be human. Lane wonders if she's going to become a more evolved being, and her doppelganger says that she doesn't really know. Lane wonders, is a human without a body really a human? What is it to be human? Her doppelganger replies repetitively, stating, Lane is Lane, and I am me, just rehashing things that Lane told herself for comfort in earlier parts of the game. Lane has a few last doubts, wondering if she should really go through with this, but her doppelganger steps in, telling her that the real world is worthless to her, and that all she needs are the recollections of the body, as long as she can keep the record of her humanity, that she doesn't need to keep that humanity itself. All that she needs is existence and will. With that, the real Lane, the one who we've known throughout the game, takes out the gun and raises it to her mouth. For a few seconds, every nerve in her body begs her to put the gun down, to preserve her life and her humanity, but it's no use. Lane pulls the trigger and dies out there on that building. And even if the doppelganger still exists and still has Lane's personality, and even if it thinks it is Lane, she isn't the real Lane. The real Lane, the conscious person who we've come to know over the course of the game, is dead. And the fact that she has a copy of herself doesn't change that. And that's where the game comes to a close. Well, not quite. Because after you finish the game, you come back to the main section and you'll find tons of new nodes, each containing messages directly from the doppelganger to the player. And that makes sense. I mean, Lane does exist on the internet and you're playing this game online. It's a pretty neat fourth wall break, to be honest. But when you're reading them, you realize that this Lane seems lonely. She seems to want someone to connect with. She seems to want to connect with the player, but she's unable to. After all, we're real, and she's just a computer program. Lane has been able to connect a version of herself to the internet where she can live forever, but there's always going to be a barrier between her and everyone else. It's a little sad seeing these messages appear, of Lane asking us to affirm her existence and to communicate with her. But we can't. There's no way to reply to what Lane is saying. And it seems like, in trying to connect with everyone, Lane has only permanently severed herself from everyone else. Just like how Lane was unable to connect with a copy of her dad, because he wasn't real. We can't connect with her in any way, because now, she isn't real. Over there, I'm everywhere. I know that. But here is connected to over there. Is that right? But then where is the real me after all is said and done? Oh, there is no real me. I guess that's it. I only exist inside those people aware of my existence. But what about this me that I can hear talking right here and now? It's me, isn't it? This me that's talking. Who is it? Who's me? So, that was really depressing. Um, so now comes the question, what does any of this even mean? Well, one of the biggest themes of the anime is definitely not to let yourself get overwhelmed by the internet and by technology. You know, the internet is great and all, but it's important to remember that it isn't reality. And I do think that the game carries that message too, but to a smaller extent. The anime feels a lot more invested in its ideas and its philosophy. That's not to say it didn't place any emphasis on its characters, it does. And I really like the anime version of Lane as well as Alice and Yasuo but they didn't feel like the primary focus. The game, on the other hand, manages to blend its characters and its ideas in such a poignant way. It expresses some really fascinating ideas about identity, reality, and memory, while also being an intensely personal story. The anime felt like the cartoon version of sitting in on a philosophy class while you're on LSD. The game, however, felt like you're right there, watching another person's idea of themselves coming apart. The game has been described as a psychological horror game, and I can see why. The concept of losing everything that makes you, you, is a terrifying one. Being stripped of your connections to the world, your confidence in your own memory, and even your understanding of what is and isn't reality, it's a frightening thing to think about. I've already talked about how effective the format of using diary entries is, but I just want to draw attention to how much more emotional it makes the game, 
Through the entries of Lane and Togo, you are brought through so much of the minds of two people who are just going through horrible and traumatic things, and you are made to fully understand how much it hurts them. And I admit that I was only able to tackle one side of the game. Like, there's a whole other aspect to the game, and how it's intertwined with the plot of the anime in a way that I just did not have enough time to cover. But I don't feel like knowing that extra information is necessary to experience the core of this story. There's a lot of meaning that can be taken from the game. Tons of attention is given to the connections we form with others, how relationships we thought would last forever will inevitably fall apart, and the unhealthy ways that we cope when those relationships are taken from us. Lane and Toko both formed attachments to people they never truly knew. They formed romanticized ideas of people like Misato and Yoshida, only to realize too late that those people were never real. In Yoshida's case, he turned out to be a cruel person, and in Misato's case, she turned out to literally be a fabrication of Lane's mind. And when Lane's dad, a person who was built up as a kind and gentle father, turns out to be a traitor who abandons his family, Lane can't deal with it, and she collapses in onto that romanticized memory of who he was by building a fake him to fill the hole in her life. And the metaphorical building of a fake version of a person in one's head is shown literally here, with Lane constructing a version of him that never existed, one who's boiled down to his role as Lane's loving father. But it's fake. This copy doesn't feel any emotions. We delude ourselves about others, especially those that have hurt us. And when what we think of them runs against what they actually are, it's difficult to handle that, and the game shows how we invent perceptions of others. But the game also talks about the masks we wear, how we lie about who we are to both ourselves and others. Toko wears the persona of a counsellor, that of a well put together adult, even as her life is crumbling, right up until it becomes all that she has, and she doesn't know who she is anymore. Lane buries the memories that hurt her so she won't have to feel the pain of those thoughts. They can't grapple with all of themselves, so they try to ignore the parts of them who they don't like, and the memories that frighten them. Which is understandable. Facing all of yourself is a harrowing thing to do, especially for a child like Lane. But those parts still exist, and they come out in ugly ways, and that just leads to the characters not knowing if they even understand themselves, and feeling lost and horrible and scared, and wanting to stop these overwhelming feelings. And so, they turn to connecting themselves to the fake world, and in doing that, they commit suicide. They kill the version of themselves that is real, and leave only the distorted memory of themselves, the lonely husk who can never truly connect to anyone or anything, just as Lane didn't truly know those around her, and created fake versions of them, she also didn't understand herself, and so she created a false her as well. And now that false her is all that is left. And even though those are the main themes, the game comments on so much more. The characters experience bullying, parental conflict, parental abuse, depression, suicidal thoughts, harassment at work, stress from work, and it makes the characters seem all the more human because most of us have dealt with at least one of the things that the characters have been through. And ironically, for a game about disconnection, the relatability of the characters actually can help us. Through them talking about the struggles that we've probably been through ourselves, and with such empathy as well, it can help people to feel understood while playing. And I think that's nice. I mentioned earlier how the depiction of Lane before committing suicide was moving for me because I experienced something like it. And it's the same as that. I think that it's great that people who play the game can connect to Lane and Toko's characters and be reminded that, yeah, people get it. To end this video, I want to bring it back to the anime once again. Because I think that it actually injects a bit of optimism into the game's despairing outlook. Serial Experiments Lane takes place in a slightly altered world, whereas Game Lane was never able to find someone who cared for her. Anime Lane did. Her father, Yasuo, and her friend Alice both acted in genuine and selfless ways to try and help Lane. Yasuo helps her understand that there are people who love her, and Alice reassures Lane that she does exist by helping her feel her heartbeat. It's because of that that Lane was able to overcome her issue and connect, really connect, with the people she cares for. And the Lane of the game and the Lane of the anime are the same person. They just exist in different universes with slightly different circumstances. And my point here is that things aren't hopeless. Anime Lane found hope, while Game Lane tragically didn't. But, well, she could have. It was never out of the question. And look, I know it's cheesy and corny, and maybe it'll ring hollow to just say, keep hoping, especially for people who've been through worse things than I could ever even imagine. And I know it's a generic thing to say, 
but I still think it's something to take away from the game. Think of all the things that Game Lane went through. Well, Anime Lane, for the most part, went through that too. She was in just as dark a place, but she was able to pull herself out of the most hopeless of circumstances. She was able to return from absolute depression and isolation. And yeah, the anime's ending is bittersweet, but what matters is that she won in the end. And in a world as lonely and frightening and alienating as that of Serial Experiments Lane, it's really nice to remember that it was never predestined for Lane to end in sadness. There was always a hope that things could have been okay. To try and tell us that hiding away from things is ultimately a ruinous decision, which will only leave us in an even worse position. And giving in to all the horrible feelings in your head just won't solve anything. That no matter how it can feel sometimes, a happy ending is possible if we just keep fighting for it. At least that's the meaning I think I want to take away from the game.